Ephesians. We'll be there in just a little bit. <clears throat> Chapter 5, I believe. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> You'll forgive me if I'm a little bit disoriented this morning. I don't think it has anything to do with five grandchildren and all of our five children being here and their spouses, etc. But um, I think maybe I can think well enough to get through the message. How many of you will pray for me? Like that little boy that was screaming bloody murder when his daddy was going to take him out for a whipping. He turned around, looked back at the congregation, said, please pray for me. All right, well, please pray for the preacher, all right? Are you glad you're here? Amen. I'm glad to see you. Last week we had 11 visitors. Today I think we got 12 visitors, don't we, Gail? She hadn't counted yet. She hadn't had time to think about it. All right. Are you glad that we got visitors? All right, good. The title of the message is, and I've been preaching a series on Bible doctrines, and most of the time when you think of Bible doctrines, you think of the doctrine of salvation, or you think of the doctrine of the last times, or you think of some other doctrine, justification, or some other thing like that. Doctrine of the Holy Spirit, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of God. You may think of those major doctrines of the Bible. But doctrine simply means teaching. And when Jesus began to teach and to preach the Sermon on the Mount, the people were amazed at his doctrine. And he said very little about the doctrine of God, very little about the doctrine of the Son, and very little about the doctrine of salvation, even though it's, it's in there. But he gave a lot of teaching, good teaching. So doctrine simply means teaching. So we're going to study the doctrine this morning that some people don't think is a doctrine, but it is a teaching, and the teaching is on the subject or doctrine of authority. It's a very, very unpopular subject for some reason or another. But let me start with this before I get into the message. Let me start with this. D.L. Moody once said, the measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. Think about it. The measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. So I could call this, instead of the doctrine of authority, I could say that it is the doctrine of servanthood. The Bible says in Mark 9, 35, and he sat down and called the 12 and saith unto them, if a man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all. And then he says, and servant of all. Now, if you're going to be a servant, there has to be authority and the right relationship with authority. And the word that we don't like to say is submit to authority. That's what we don't like for some reason. Now, I wonder why that is. Now, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of this, that some of the things that the devil doesn't want us to get from the Word of God, and he fights against it the most, must be probably one of the greatest things that we can even experience as a Christian. So the devil fights hard against the teaching or doctrine of authority because he knows that it will empower the life. And so I pray that you will understand that this morning, I'm not trying to give something that is hard or harsh or negative. I'm trying to preach or to teach something that is powerful, that will change your life. How many of you want to see God really work in your life? Amen. Well, this doctrine of authority is one of the most teachings in the Bible that will change a life. And then it says in Philippians 2, 7 about the Lord Jesus Christ, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Anybody knows that in those days slavery was common and the form of a servant was like Jesus saying I'm a slave and a slave has to. There's no choice. Has to 
be submissive to authority. And then it says, and was made in the likeness of sinful, likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now listen to this illustration. Those two scriptures give me this idea of servanthood or authority. But listen to this illustration. The scene is North Shore Baptist Church in Chicago. The man of interest is Deacon James L. Kraft, who was superintendent of the Sunday School and founder of Kraft Foods. Have you ever heard of Kraft Foods? Anybody? Yeah. Kraft said that as a young man, he had a desire to be the most manufacturer and salesman of cheese in the world. He planned on becoming rich and famous by making and selling cheese and began as a young fellow with a little buggy pulled by a pony named Paddy. I guess that's where we get the phrase Paddy Wagon. After making his cheese, the youth would load his wagon and he and Paddy would drive down the streets of Chicago to sell the cheese. As the months passed by, the young craft began to despair because he was not making any money in spite of his long hours and hard work. One day, he pulled his pony to a stop and began to talk with him. He said, Paddy, there is something wrong. We are not doing it right. I'm afraid we have things turned around and our priorities are not where they ought to be. Maybe we ought to serve God and place him first in our lives. Kraft then drove home and made a covenant that for the rest of his life, he would first serve God and then would work as God directed. Many years after this, Kraft was heard to make this statement. I would rather be a layman in North Shore Baptist Church than to head the greatest corporation in America. My job first is serving the Lord. There is a man who learned to be submissive to God and God's will. He found where his authority should be, where the authority should be placed in his life. So our subject today is authority or servanthood or submission. Any of those terms will fit. Here's what changed the life of D.L. Moody. This thing on authority changed the life of D.L. Moody. What changed the life of James L. Craft? This particular issue, doctrine, teaching of authority. But Moody said, and I like this one, we may easily be too big for God to use, but never too small. Now you think about that. We may easily be too big for God to use, but never too small. Our subject today is the second nail, not nail in the coffin, the second nail in our series of seven nails that will give structure to your life. The first message on the structure of our life was last Sunday, and the first nail was design. And that design means that God is our designer and that he has designed every single detail about our lives for the very purpose of portraying him, being a picture of God or a reflection of God to other people. That is our design by our designer himself. As we began teaching on design, we stated that there are four scriptural prerequisites or procedures you must follow spiritually for accepting any teaching in the Bible or for accepting any doctrine in the Bible. I don't care if it's the doctrine of salvation. I don't care if it's the doctrine of last times. I don't care if it's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if it's this teaching on submission and authority or the teaching on design. Whatever it is, there's four things that must happen in our hearts before we will accept it. You see, the devil does not want you, nor I, nor any other believer to accept the teaching of God's word. 
He's going to try every way. So there's got to be four things that happen before you accept this teaching. Number one, there's got to be openness. That doesn't mean open your mind and let junk come in. That means open your heart and let Jesus and the Holy Spirit teach you. Amen? The Bible says that in Isaiah that Jesus came to open the blind eyes. So that is referring to our hearts. We just cannot see. The heart is the, might say, the eyes of the soul. And so we cannot see things like we should. I'm amazed. Aren't you amazed that some of our political leaders just can't see? Is that right? Some of our political leaders are blind, are absolutely blind. But think about the Christian who is blind to the teachings of God's word. And we often are. So we have to have openness. We have to ask the Lord to open our blinded eyes to accept any doctrine. I don't care what it is. But I'll tell you this. You better be sure to pray, Lord, open my eyes about this doctrine today, this one on authority. And then there, number two, the first thing is openness if you're going to accept any teaching or doctrine. Second thing is freedom. Not only did Isaiah say that Jesus would come to open blind eyes, said he would free the prisoners from prison to bring out the prisoners from the prison. Each of us is bound in our own bars, so to speak. We have inhibitions. We have traditions. We have all kinds of things. We have our own theology, so to speak. And we believe a certain way because somebody said it. A fellow came to church one time and he says, I, I didn't commit suicide because I believe that if you commit suicide, you go straight to hell. He had a belief that somebody told him that if you commit suicide, you go straight to hell. That's not in the Bible, right? That's not in the Bible. A Christian can commit suicide, and if a, commit, a Christian commits suicide, they don't go to hell, right? Amen. So here you got some things that people believe. So that thing to him, that belief that he had was a, a bar, a prison. So he needs to be free from that belief. And you and I, if we're going to believe authority this morning, we better be free from some things that we think. Now, one of the greatest bars in our life is that I'm my own boss. That's a big bar. That's a prison house for sure. And then there's another thing, third thing, except in your doctrine, is vision. Isaiah, in another passage of Scripture, said this. He said, Enlarge the place of thy tent. Stretch forth the curtains and lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. In other words, stretch out. Beyond your comfort zone. Go beyond where you normally do. This is not into something that is unusual or something ungodly. This is, you need to get out of where you are just so, feel so secure and so safe right here in this little spot. And he says, stretch out. Lengthen your cords. Go beyond. In other words, have a vision. One needs spiritual vision to see this doctrine of authority because people don't like it. Natural man just flat out does not like it. Satan doesn't like it. He's the first one to rebel against authority and he doesn't like this teaching because he knows that authority is a primary a tool for God to mold and make a life and make it powerful, a powerful life. So I want you to get the idea, not this morning, of something dreadful and terrible. I want you to get the idea of something that is powerful, something that is great, something that will change your life forever. Do you really believe that God's word can change a life? How many of you think that your life, I don't care where you are in your spiritual experience, can be changed for God and better? Amen? Amen. So the third, fourth thing in this prerequisites for accepting any doctrine is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. How many of you think that if I'm going to accept any doctrine from the Bible, I don't care what it is, that doesn't matter the doctrine. Whether it be the doctrine of this authority or the doctrine of something, you say, I need the Holy Spirit to help me. I need divine help. Lord, help me. Is that right? Would you like the Lord to teach you and to help you with this subject of authority? Would you? Amen. Thank you. I hope we all have that prayer. May the Lord give us this morning spiritual openness, spiritual freedom, spiritual vision, and spiritual help from the Holy Spirit. Nails in the life are to give structure or strength to a structure or stability to the structure. 
Our second nail, the first one was design. Our second nail is authority. Many times, have I said already several times, this is looked on as being very negative. Our old nature does not like this idea at all. Look what submission to God's authority did to James L. Craft. Made him one of the greatest Christians in the world, but also made him one of the greatest businessmen in the world. Did he have the business first or God first? By his own testimony, he put God first. So it will change your life. Let me say this about this subject. This subject more than anything else, this subject more than anything else will either make or break a believer. This subject more than anything else will either make or break a believer. You say, preacher, why? Because the devil fights so hard against it and he wants us all not to obey this doctrine so that we'll be bound in sin. So, as we continue on, we need a nail in our life, the nail of design. It says that God created us for a purpose that's a reflection of him to other people. But there's also another nail, that's the nail of authority. And that nail is necessary. God put in your life, here's what God put in every life. Every life here, including this one and the ones in the back, every life has these four authorities in their life. The first authority in the life is the home or the parents. And we know what the Bible says about that. And that authority was given right off the bat in the Garden of Eden. Amen? Well, outside the garden as well. Mainly outside the garden. And then the second one was the government. And human government was created after the flood. You may not like this order, but this is God's order. He put the family and the next thing comes is the human government. You think about that. Human government after the flood. And then next one in the New Testament is the church. So you have the first authority is the family, the second parents, the second authority you have this human government, third authority, not, I don't think they have order of importance, but this is the way they come in the Bible. The next one is the church is an authority. And that began at Calvary or at Pentecost. Unlike the government and unlike the family, the church has not received the position of authority that it ought to have. I have often heard this statement. I said, if, if you get a good Roman Catholic converted, they make a good Baptist church member. And I've often wondered, why does a good Roman Catholic converted make a good Baptist church member? I think one of the reasons is that they learned a long time ago in the Roman Catholic Church that the church was the authority in their life. They learned that. And when they went over to become uh, independent Baptists uh, as a converted Catholic, they became strong, strong independent Baptist believers because they already had a background of the church is the authority in their life. Now, we have long since, with our forefathers, thrown out the authority of the Roman Catholic Church in our lives, and rightly so. But when you throw out the Roman Catholic Church as the authority in your life, you're not supposed to throw the church out with it. Amen? The church is still an authority in the life of the believer. Sometimes we do things that we don't understand how we do it or why we do it. So now we have independent believers and independent churches and the church is absolutely no authority. That's not going to work. And then you say, well, preacher, how do you know that the church is an authority? How many of you have read the book of Acts? Anybody besides me read the book of Acts? I've read the book of Acts. Me and Peter read it. She's even read it. <laughs> hey, how many of you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Anybody besides me and Pete and Tom? Yes, and Gail, yeah, so a few more people read it. I mean, was, were they in the church? And did the church take authority in what they were selling their land for, et cetera, et cetera? And did they die? Whoa, what a story. It's 
all about the New Testament church being an authority into the life of a believer. Well, I don't like that. That's exactly why it needs to be preached. Amen? How many of you know it needs to be preached because we don't like it? That's a pretty good sign. Let me give you the scriptures in Ephesians 5, and you know I've referred to them often. We're going to start with the family since that's the way God started. In Ephesians 5, 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, I want you to do this. Before you read or think about the rest of it, because some of you already know what the rest of it says. Most of you do. But before you even get down to husbands and wives, you need to stop right here and get this one. Submission one to another. Amen? So if everybody was submissive one to another, we wouldn't have any problems with husbands and wives. Is that right? Amen. And we wouldn't have any problems with church members and pastors, would we? In other words, it goes across the board everywhere. Submission one to another would take care of a whole lot of things. By the way, the ultimate attitude of a believer ought to be submission to one another. People ought to see that. Boom. That's that flat, that fast. But then it goes on, of course, Dear wives, I'm sorry that you have to, and this is not for our anniversary sake. It had nothing to do with anniversaries. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And I got to say this I got a submissive wife. And how many of you know that? How many of you say, Preacher, I believe that? Yeah, I believe it, man. I know. For the husband is the head of the wife, and is Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Do you know what that verse does? It puts me in a huge, huge responsible part. The husband has a great, big responsibility. How many of you know that? The husband has a big responsibility. He's the head of the wife, and as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. He's to save the body, or the wife, and the children. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Now, some, some of you ladies want me to stop real good right there. Husbands, love your wives. How many of you ladies want me to stop real good right there? One. Just Gail? Come on, wives, are you chicken? I mean, I'm just joking. Yeah. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and clean it with the wash of water by the word. Now, here's what he's doing. Husbands, love your wives, that he might sanctify, set her apart, and so on, and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. It's the husband's responsibility to do that. That he might present it to himself a glorious church and not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You see, the wife may be said to submit, but the husband has said, you've got to make sure that she's holy. How do you like them apples? Men, you got a big job. Preacher, you got a big job. I'm thankful the Lord's given me a pretty easy one. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so it's not getting many amens this morning. I don't know what it is. All right. For this cause shall a man lead. Let's see, for we are members of his body. They say, for, as, for 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of one of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, I say amen. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, every one of you in particular so love his wife. That, meant, that means don't love another's wife. Right? Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. It means don't love another wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, the teaching of the family. I know that's a lot, uh, a lot there to preach on and to teach on. But here's the thing. The teaching of the family as an authority structure is needed in our society today more than ever. How many of you, as you see the protesters in the street say, where is the mamas and the daddies? Amen? Who? You say, well, that's, some of them don't have daddies. Well, there's a problem. Amen? Well, you know they did have one. But you say, preacher, what is going on in America? Can we not see, is it not evident with our physical eyes, not even our spiritual eyes, with our physical eyes, isn't it evident that the design and the authority is completely missing? From our young people? 
Amen. False teachings like the village ideology has greatly reduced the authority of the family. Amen? We must constantly be alert to the sly methods of Satan to negate the authority of the family. And this CRT teaching is doing the same thing. Amen? There is a spiritual power in the family for those who recognize spiritual teaching like I'm teaching this morning. <clears throat> this is where the family breaks down. Authority. One or the other in the family thinks that they are the authority or they think that somebody ought to be submissive but not them. Submission to one another in the fear of God is necessary before any submission can rightfully take place between a wife and a husband or church and a pastor, etc. The struggle for domination in the family is typical. Now listen to this. The struggle for domination in the family is typical of an unsaved family, but it ought not to be typical of a saved family. Amen? No amens? It should be very evident in a Christian family that there is this teaching on authority. <clears throat> As a child, I was reared in a family that followed this teaching it wasn't verbalized like I'm doing right now. But we knew who was the boss in the family. We knew who, what our parents said goes. That was right. There were some rocky roads along the way, as all of my brothers and sisters can attest. Let me give you this quick illustration. As I was growing up, one day, I was asked to come down to a neighbor's house and to play with their grandkids from Roanoke, Virginia. And they came down about once a year. And when they came down, they came in all their fancy clothes. They were rich, and the car was nice. And, uh, and the grandmother was our neighbor. And the grandmother would call up to the house and ask my mom if it can Danny come play with my two grandsons? They don't have anybody to play with. And so as a little bitty fella, Mama says, oh, she didn't like us going nowhere much. But she said, that'd be nice to this older lady who was a member of the first church in town. She said, I'm going to let Danny go down and play with the kids. So we went down to play one day with these two little grandsons of our neighbor. And they said, We'd like to get in the car. We'd go somewhere and do something. I don't know if it's good or ice cream or what. But they said, we'd like to get pile in the car so that would be uh, husband and wife and grandmother and three boys. We're going to pile in this car and that would fill it up pretty good. And we're going down to somewhere. And so I had to call my mom. The grandmother called the mom and said, can Danny go with us to get whatever we're going to do? And she said, I know I could almost hear it on the phone. I just almost, she didn't want that to happen, but she said, okay. So we got to, in the car, all packed in, mom and dad in the front, and grandma and three boys in the back, all saucies together. And about that time, as the car made a kind of a backed up and headed out the driveway, all of a sudden the car went, <laughs> stopped like that. The mother by the way, the mother worked with a TV station in Roanoke, Virginia, but she wasn't on air. She never was on the camera, but she worked behind the scenes in a big TV station in Roanoke, Virginia. And the husband was a wealthy man, had a great successful career there in Roanoke. But anyway, all of a sudden the car went on the driveway and the mother and the father were arguing about something and I couldn't tell what they were arguing about. And the door slung open on the passenger side and this, uh, Nice looking, I mean, well dressed lady that works for a TV station jumps out of the car with anger on her face and takes her hair comb. She'd been combing her hair and she threw that hair comb up against the side of the house. And I'm sure there were a few words that I wasn't supposed to hear. <laughs> 
I was going, I was sinking down like this. I was getting, trying to get as low as I could in the seat, you know. I want you to know something, folks. I had never seen my mom and dad do that. Never. And I didn't know what to think about it. So finally, after five minutes or so, I was sitting there and everybody just quiet as a mouse. Nobody said nothing. It was just, all of a sudden, the lady comes out of the house her demeanor is more sad than anything else and she gets in the car nobody says anything and we begin to move off real solid and the grandmother said to his her daughter you ought to be ashamed of yourself and that was about it folks i want to tell you something i told you that to tell you this for the first time in my little life, I was a little kid, for the first time in my little life, I saw a lack of authority in a home. And it blew me away as a kid. I've never forgot that scene. It's printed up here in my mind. Do you know what, folks? I'm going to tell you something. Fussing and fighting ought not to be the normal Christian life in a family. Amen? Christian moms and dads may do it every now and then but it ought not to be the norm amen amen can I get a a woman can't get a amen maybe I get a woman all right and I want you to know something sometimes the kids can provoke the moms and dads to fighting amongst themselves in other words the kids that get moms and dads at one another and I want you to know something, children. It's not right for you to provoke your mom and dad against each other. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I don't want any elbows going anywhere. I don't want any looks. <laughs> I want any family here to exhort. I want to exhort every family to commit to practicing this teaching on authority. It solves a great deal of fussing and fighting that people do. The sad thing that I find about folks that fuss and fight, they think nobody knows it. But how many of you know that when parents fuss and fight, somebody notices? How many of you know that? Somebody's going to see it. There's no doubt about it. You say, here's what we need. According to our passage of Scripture that I read from Ephesians 5, submission one to another but let's let me back it up and kind of back through it a little bit let's start down at the end it said be filled with the Holy Spirit in other words we should be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and then we should speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs see verse 17 and 18 come before that passage on submission and so we've got to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to ourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs I think speaking to ourselves in psalms and spiritual songs would solve a whole lot of problems and then submission to one another, and then the wife's submission, and then the husband's love and great responsibility for sanctifying, cleansing, and presenting his bride to Christ. So Christ is going to present the church as a bride to Christ, and the husband is presenting his bride to Christ as well. So here, you ready for another story? How about it? How many of you think another story would fit right here? Okay, here's another story. You won't, you'll love this one. I'm sitting in my office studying, okay? You, how many of you know I've got a little utility room that I made into an office, and it's about four foot wide and about eight foot long? How many of you, you didn't know that, but you know it now, okay? Four foot wide and about eight, six, eight foot long. So I took this utility room and put books in it and put your computers in it, and that's where I study. Well, I can, own, I can barely turn around. When the chair is facing the computer, if I turn around, I'm hitting something, so I can barely turn around. So Daniel comes in the door one day last week, I believe it was last week, and he said, don't turn around. I've got something to present to you. Whoa, man. That's a big deal right there. When Daniel comes in and says, don't turn around, i got something to present to you. So I kind of eased back a little back behind me. He said, don't turn around. I've got something to present to you. And I noticed his back is to me. And he knows I'm turning around to see what he's got, but he turns his back and he's fiddling with something. So he 
finally pulls out from a bag these five things that he wanted to present to me. Number one was garlic flavored bait spray. Number two was crawdad spray bait spray. Number three was JJ's Magic. I don't know what that is. I hadn't tried it yet. And along with those three fishing lures, you might say, the next one was, it wasn't in a bottle, it wasn't a spray, it was in a little plastic bag, it was cat cheese. Ooh. And the fifth one, believe it or not, in that little plastic bag was gizzard shad. You didn't want to smell either one of them. Needless to say, I was quite amazed at this presentation. So Daniel is dying to try these things out and see if they work. So he's really, he's presenting something to me as a bribe to go fishing. So we go to Coles Carp and Catfish Pond up off of 290, I think. And uh, that's a catch and release place. You can't keep a catfish. And so we go up there and it's raining. It always seems to rain when you got something like that. So after this five special presentation, and I mean it's special, I was impressed, really impressed. I'm not joking. Daniel was presenting this to me this in Daniel's way, and I was impressed positively. I liked it. I wasn't making fun of him a while ago. I was pleased that he was presenting these things to me. So off we go and we get some chicken and we spray it with garlic spray. And it's raining like cats and dogs and I mean nobody's there but us and we didn't even get a bite. So about dark, the owner had told us, he said, you go up to the upper pond. It's got a fewer fish, but they're pretty good size. And said, we're just trying to get it going. He said, but go up to the upper pond if you get a chance. So we decided we can't catch anything down here after two hours, so let's go up to the upper pond. It's almost dark. And so first thing, I throw out mine. I want to get the bite first, you know, so I got my garlic sprayed chicken, and I threw it out there. And then Daniel had his garlic sprayed chicken and he threw it out there. Daniel got a bite. I didn't. I don't know, mine must have been too deep or stunk too much. I don't know which way it was. And all of a sudden, this fish struggled. And he got up closer and closer and I had it. Daniel said, get the net, get the net, get the net. I got the net. And I'm gonna reach out there and grab this fish and I see him swirling in the water. Daniel's got him and he's going, he said, that's a big one. I said, yeah, he's pretty big. And he gets him up close. And by the time he gets him up close to the shore, he has another rod sitting up here on the bottom with some more chicken sprayed with garlic. And all of a sudden that rod up there went, ding, 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 ding. Said, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. So he's trying to catch this one and he wants me to get that one. And I got the net in my hand. I said, what am I supposed to do? Catch this fish? I go up there. By that time, that fish did a big old turn right at the, bank and went snap Daniel said what do you do that for I do nothing that thing was uh, folks it started out this long but now it's this long he, he was a monster I'm telling you his back his tail was like this I'm serious he was a big one and anyway that guy told me I said, he said how big do you think he was I said I think he's somewhere between 5 and 10 pounds he said, well, the we, ones we put in there were bigger than that. So it could have been 20 or more. But all I know is this. I told Daniel, I said, you ought to catch what you got in your hand first before you try to get that over there. Is that right? But the thought I wanted to bring to you was this. Daniel presented five things to me from his heart. And he wanted to try it. And here's what I'm doing. 
the Lord is going to present his bride to God pure spotless without blemish and the husband is to present his wife and his children the husband is to present his wife and his children to the Lord holy without spot and without blemish now that can only happen when there is spiritual authority in the home Amen. In the home, in the church, in the government, and the last one I didn't even get to is business. There's four authorities. I think I might have said business. But there's four authorities in every life. First one was family, the second one was government, and the third one was the home, and the fourth one is business, employers, employees. How many of you think I'm through with this sermon? through with this sermon. I got to stop. Let's bow our heads for prayer.